Hello, Warriors. How's everyone doing? Hugo, how are you? Kevin, Alexander. Hi, Jeff. <clears throat> nice rebound in s and peace. So, big week coming here in the s and P's. Um, I think we have to stay under 3380 for the bearish uh, momentum to continue. Uh, I have less leverage this week. Hi, Giuseppe. Um, actually taking a shot in the gold here that this could just be an ABC back to this uh, resistance at 1890. And silver, similar situation outperforming gold today, but you know, right back here at major resistance here. So um, going with the gold because it's not as strong. It's a 0.6% compared to silver up 1.6. Uh, Want to talk a little bit about the dollar. Um, although we've had a nice advance, you know, compared to the risk off move, I think Greg mentioned it too. It's been uh, somewhat anemic, uh, that really hasn't had the same kind of gusto. Does that mean I'm going to short it? Uh, it does not. I still have to, as long as we're above, um, I'd call it this 9330 level, uh, give it the benefit of the doubt. We are starting to diverge again. Looks like we have a two drive here, but you know, not that impressed with the action in the dollar con considering the move we had here, check it out. Well, pretty deep compared to dollar strength. So uh, back under 93 and a half, I think this uh, rally has terminated. Everyone with me on that? Um, I am looking for a, a spot in Euro pound, but not yet. Uh, still wanna see maybe one more low, 89.40, 89.50 here. And I really don't know what to do with the Euro right now. Uh, this is where I would like to buy Euro. All right, down here, 114-ish. So, uh, this is where, you know, I think that uh, the dollar might uh, be peaking around 95 and a half, 96. So um, this is a long-term entry down here. So I'm starting to think about long-term entries because it's gonna be pretty wild here. And the end was something I wanted to talk about because you have this wedge developing here, see this? And, you know, I thought there might be another attempt, another attempt down here, but, you know, uh, we start getting back over 105, uh, the end's gonna look good. I, I still am in the camp of higher yields. I'm starting to have more company on the yield question and yields are down a little bit today. But when I look at the daily, I don't wanna fade this trend. I still think there's more upside in yields. Okay, and uh, that may help the dollar a bit to achieve this bear market rally. So I'm not long-term bullish a dollar, actually, you know, think that a move up to here might be the best uh, dollar short of the year. Okay, so let's see if we could get it. And one more break in gold. You know, I really don't uh, like being sh uh, short metals because, because of, uh, except for the technical formation, because there's an awful lot of uh, bearishness in gold, especially after last week. If you look at the DSI, both gold and silver are um, under 20. Okay, so it's not like there are a lot of bulls out there that it's overdone and a lot of people to wash out. But I still think there might be one more shoe to drop that could take gold back down towards 1830, 1820. Maybe with this speed line, let's see, that's not gonna show it. 
Let's go with this. So I'm getting this message on TradeView the past couple days. Um, this speed line comes in at 1820. Okay. All the way down here, that may be it. And I just wanted to make one comment about crypto. You know, all last week, uh, everything was liquidating out, right? You had gold down, you had the market down, you had the dollar up, and Bitcoin was uh, resilient until we got to 14,000. 14, so uh, actually on a relative strength basis, uh, crypto seems to be where it is, the relative strength. So um, I think that we're, it will succumb, especially for going to 3,000 in the S&Ps. And that we could go all the way back down to, I think Peter Goodburn saying 9,000. And uh, that'll be confirmed if we negate the breakout, say about 12.8. So keep an eye on those levels there. Any questions? Does everyone know how to subscribe so you're in our chat room for the election? You guys know how to do it? So you could have a, a good month this week, hanging out with the crew. You just go to home. You know, you're subscribing now, beautiful. I don't think you're gonna be disappointed. Okay. So um, I know Blake's gonna feel uh, very uh, energized. Um, he gets to sleep an extra hour. I don't. He does. Welcome, Blake. You lucky guy. I, I know it's it. It really is is great. I I went to sleep a little early last night. I got a full <laughs> night's sleep. It's uh, actually I. I I'm, honestly, I got all right. Up no, I I don't want to hear about it. Anymore. No, I I I got up early. Um, <laughs> Because you're Twice, and, I, and I had to force myself, like, hey, you've got a couple, of, it's two o'clock in the morning, go back to sleep. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I, I did yeah. a lot of that. Isn't that nice? Night. I woke up at like, I don't know, uh, five to four before my alarm went off, and I go, oh, maybe I have some time to go back to sleep. And I said, well, five minutes, I don't think so. I'll get up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good feeling when you wake up and you still have some time to sleep. So, yeah anyway, i'm glad for you i'm sad for me <laughs> yeah i know it's it, it's a little sad isn't it uh yeah especially with the pandemic and right, right. Chaos. anyway it's going to be a, a wild week don't you think bro it should be hey can you uh give me a test what kind of test okay there you're in test I, I, I was just adjusting my speakers i don't know oh okay are. i stayed up all night studying for a urine test once <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> i pulled an all-nighter anyway so uh is the blog done oh i'll have to let the guys the guys explain that one right. uh yeah I know I promised everybody a blog and then we got no blog and that, that, but it, it's the, uh, the, um, blog is down right now. Um, oh, that's right. The blog. I, yeah. So huh? I saw that the blog, uh, the site, that part. Yeah. Is yeah. And, and, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to get it up and running right now, but, okay. um, you know, the blog's been, Hey, the good news is the blog post has been written for a couple of days. So that's, that's all right. Uh, so it should be out anytime. So and the race is tightening, bro. What's that? I guess the race is tightening. It is. It is. Um, I'm going to take over the screen right now. The race uh, is, did you say the race is tightening? Yeah, that's what I've been hearing, you know, <sighs> that it's tightening a little bit in some swing states. You know, I, I think it is. It, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be happy and I'm sure most of you guys are going to be happy when this is over. Over? Um, yeah. Yeah. When we're finished here, it's, it, it's, you know, how long will that take? I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, there's a couple key States and um, 
you know, the, the states that I, I think that we really need to pay attention to will be Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Yeah. right. And Florida. Um, the, the, the fact is that if, you know, if, if, if Trump like loses Florida, it's going to be really tough for him to win. Um, from the analysis that I've read, it's like, if he loses Florida, it's like he, his, his path to winning is going to be really difficult. Um, well, no Florida tonight too. There are a few States that will fully report tomorrow night. Florida being one of them, I believe. Yeah. And I, and I don't, I don't see, I, I actually see Trump winning Florida. It's just, you know, that, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. What I How think, about Arizona where you're at Blake, that, that um, would, that's an important one. It, I, I think it is more for the Republican party, not so much for Trump. I, I think Arizona is uh, one of those States that, um, you know, Republicans will be watching in case we turn blue and we're, we're really, um, a, it's a very tight race here. So that's okay. something to pay attention to. I, I, I actually think Arizona will stay red. Um, uh, let me ask if, you one more question. I'm going to let you go. Are you looking to do anything but day trade this week, Blake? No, I'm just looking to be very, very short term. Well, I, I take that back. Um, it depends. It, it depends. Like when if you have uh, a lead and you could let it run and tighten up your stops. Yeah. Or, or if I'm, I'm like, you know, if I'm, I'm sitting here trading and I'm like, Oh wow, we got to, you know, um, like, let's just say, I, I mean, this is not going to happen, but let's say Texas turns blue. It's like, Holy cow. Oh, yeah. you know, Trump, Trump can't win, yeah. you know, period. And then, then you have to make a decision based on, you know, what the market's doing because of that. Um, I or, think Polly thinks it's going to turn blue. I think he does, but I, I don't, I don't agree with him. I don't think okay. it, I, I don't think it will. And I, and I, I think I'm probably in the majority, but again, it's just, it, you know, what I decide to do mostly will be a result of what happens tomorrow night and the States that are winning or, you know, have said that they won, you know, that type of thing. And then I'll, I'll make my decisions based on that. And I'll be in the chat rooms talking about it. So again, if you guys, uh, you know, want to have uh, an all nighter to tomorrow night. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll probably be pulling an all nighter tomorrow night, or at least I'll be up pretty late. And, um, you know, it's just part of election night. Um, and just kind of seeing where we go from there. So okay, uh, it should be interesting, uh, to say the least. So, That'll be it. And uh, what we've got to do really today is prepare for, um, you know, what I, I think today is going to be pretty choppy. Uh, and, you know, I don't I don't see today being super directional, uh, although uh, right now the Aussie is making highs on the day. The Kiwi's making highs on the day. You know, the dollar Canadians making lows, um, which is typically a risk on type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, market signal. So let's take a look at where everything's at and let's get the bias chart done and um, kind of get set up for tomorrow. I think tomorrow is going to be a little bit more telling as far as our ranges of where we are at and where we should be. Okay. So we're going to start with the Euro and um, the Euro dollar it, it's, you know, surprisingly holding near yet uh, last week's lows. I mean, we're not, very, it's not very strong uh, at this moment and that, really does concern me uh, regarding the Euro. It, you know, I, I would have thought by this time, the Euro would have been a lot stronger and that really the dovish um, uh, attitude of, of, uh, of Christine Lagarde really is weighing on, weighing on the, uh, the Euro as a whole. So, um, and again, do I, do I think that the Euro can go um, higher from here? I do, but it's, again, it's trading really heavy. Hey, excuse me real, really quick. Um, Steve, is Steve or Stelios here? I'm here. Good morning. Hey, Stelios, can you take over for just a few minutes? I got to deal with it. My time change is different. So my dogs are like, I, I got to let them out really quick. I'll be, I can be back in just a few minutes and then I'm going to finish yeah. up. The, I'll start up the bias chart. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thanks, man. Hey. <clears throat> hey, Sal. 
Hey, how you doing? Good, buddy. So, uh, what are your plans for this week? Um, my plans for this week. Well, I'm going to be looking. Let me take the screen just for one second. Go ahead, bro. Just yeah. screen. Are you getting the same thing? Uh, same messages? No, this page is unresponsive. This has to do with your web browser, not um, oh. the site itself. So, I would suggest just killing the web browser, restarting your laptop, or and just. Starting okay. over. It just means that one of the pages is, is really heavy on your resources. That's what it I is. see. Okay. Um, so what, are, what will I be doing? I will be reacting to um, what happens. But in my opinion, um, there is one scenario where I think it's going to be very risk on. And that's a uh, blue sweep. You know, Biden wins comprehensively everywhere. I think that's um, maybe not in the very short term. There's going to be a little bit of a... Um, uh, a volatility in the beginning but i think overall it should be a risk on move biden will be able to push anything he wants any kind of bill anything and um you know with no um resistance then they can just go ahead and do whatever they want and what do the what do the governments want to do they want to they want more of everything right so i think equities are going to be doing well in that scenario but for my in my opinion every other scenario is not going to be good uh, and uh, I think there, there, there's a good chance that there's going to be a little bit of trouble. I don't think the, um, uh, that Biden's going to win uh, by a landslide like a lot of people do. Um, I think it's going to be a lot, a lot closer. And um, remember, we're not going to know the results straight away. Or at least that's the theory. Uh, and uh, I, I was reading um, something Trump said, uh, was it yesterday, I think? He said that uh, he's going to announce, you know, if he yeah. has a lead, he's going to announce that he's won. On the day election day and then right you know, and he said uh, i think he said the words that they're going to try and take the uh, you know we win and then they're going to try to take it back in the next few days or something like that which is you know you have to count all the votes you can't just announce that you won uh, and and move on from that so i think there's going to be a little bit of trouble i think there's going to be volatility and i think most scenarios are risk off but there is that one risk on scenario and frankly if there is a blue sweep and that happens um uh, I'm just going to get long risk wherever the market is. I don't care because I'm not a day trader. I'm just going to start getting long risk uh, and, um, um, you know, with, with a more medium term uh, view. So if that happens, uh, um, I know you're looking for the potential of a dollar spike yes. to the upside. Uh, uh, do you think that that scenario would <clears throat> create a pretty big downdraft in the Dixie? Um. Yes, I think. Look, this this is the, the DXY chart. We it could be a false breakdown. It could be, you know, wham straight away down. I think we might. I think there's going to be a little bit. It's not going to be as clear. Uh, the results are not going to be clear straight away. So I think that's going to probably drive a dollar spike higher, and then we're going to go lower. So I mean, obviously, this is one scenario. The other scenario, just we just keep going lower. My medium-term view for the dollar is to go lower. That's without a doubt. But I do think we are at risk of a spike. Uh, before that and that's I'm, I'm kind of hoping we get that because then i'm gonna i want to get into some trades uh you know we've talked about these here uh gold and silver and maybe some dollar pairs and um, equities as well you know i want to get long equities but not right now um so i think that's that's the risk and and frankly i think the market is really not pricing that um too much at the moment i think the market is thinking yeah joe biden is done and you know, we have, we have something, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's similar. We have this um, far-right neo-Nazi party, at least we had it, they're now in prison, but we had this uh, party here in Greece and the previous elections, um, they were polling at like four or five percent. And we were thinking, Jesus, you know, how come they've gone from 0.1% to four or five percent? They actually got nine um, percent overall. So people who were going to vote for them didn't say it in the polls. They were, I don't know, they were embarrassed to say it. It was like... Um, it was a, um, um, a vote where people are just frustrated with everything and go, right, we're going to vote for these guys. They're going to clean the place up. And that's what happened. And now they've gone back to zero, obviously. But, you know, I think we have there, there is a chance that in the polls, people are not saying um, what they're going to vote for. So the polls can be wrong. We saw that four years ago in a big way. Uh, and um, I really do think it's going to be close. Of course, I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times in the past, but I think it's going to be closer than people think. I think so yep. too, Stelios. I have to agree with that. And one of the, one of the other things that I, I think is is true in this situation is that the polls have really 
adjusted adjusted as well you know what i mean they've they've adjusted because they were wrong so wrong in 2016 they automatically have to give trump uh, a couple points just because of their mishaps from last time does that make sense it does yeah it does. yeah so i i and and that's that's one of the other things that you know makes me um believe that that we might have um you know, well, well, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it, I still think it's going to be close, but th then again, the flip side of that is if, if, if pollsters have been giving a big, um, you know, bigger lead, bigger lead or a, a less of a lead for Biden because of how wrong they were, maybe it ends up being a landslide victory for Biden. Who knows? That is, that is one of my main case scenarios why I say that it's a higher possibility scenario because we've had this experience here with the referendum in, in Grace Blake. I mean, uh, the polls were wrong, a lot wrong. And it happens that Katerina has a like very good friend that is a statistician and works for like the biggest uh, poll companies here in Greece. And he had told us that, you know, they had to go um, check, you know, what they should change, what they should do um, to adapt for, you know, the new reality that people often aren't frank with the polls and a lot of people don't want to express their opinion, so on and so forth. And indeed, they made it so. Uh, next elections we had, the polls were very, very, very close uh, to the real outcome. So uh, I 100% agree with uh, your comment. Yeah, yeah, it, and I mean it's it's a it's a, it's a possibility. All right, guys. Well, hey, I appreciate your feedback and Stelios. Thanks for stepping in because I actually had to. Um, I, my <coughs> dogs think it's an hour. Well, it is. It's. I mean, <laughs> it's it's their normal time for me. It's, I'm an hour <laughs> later. Uh, okay. So they they're like, hey, let let us out. I'm like. Okay, I got. I guess I got to. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take over here, um, and then we're gonna go ahead and uh, do the bias chart really quick. I'll get that out of the way. Um, and I want to thank everybody for for your patience, uh, and thanks everybody for your patience regarding the blog. Uh, Steve, do we have an update on the blog? Um, it's not from our side. Uh, so we've already opened the ticket for customer support to see what's wrong with. Uh, that server, it's nothing we can do or it's something we can have done right. So we're just waiting now. I'm about ready to start taking screenshots of the verbiage. I'm going to start tweeting it out if that, if that's good, if that's where we have to be. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. It should be up. I think we should. Yeah, I think we should. We should resolve the issue, you know, within the next few hours. Exactly. Okay, so let's go ahead and deal with these charts. As I, as I was saying a little bit earlier regarding the euro, the euro is still trading really heavy. I'm really surprised actually quite uh, about how heavy it is trading, even with the dollar weakness that we've seen. Uh, you know, you've seen the Aussie reverse strongly off of the, you know, the, the uh, 70 cent level or the pro below 70 cents. You see the Kiwi near its highs of the session. Uh, look at the euro. Yours is not doing anything. And that that's really nerve wracking. Uh, if, if you're long the euro right now, I think that is a big risk for the euro. Now, um, I think while the euro trades below this previous support right here at 116, well, actually we can write down 117, but just to, just to make it even, but I believe that while we're trading below here, It's going to be, you know, you, you got to kind of target 115 at this point. And because I do think 115 is the um, target that we're all kind of waiting for. We've been waiting for it for, for weeks and months, but, you know, I think it could easily be achieved um, knowing how heavy it's trading right now. Uh, obviously, support's going to be these trend lows. So let's go ahead and write those two levels down. Uh, support being here at 116.10. Um, I think that's the exact spike low right around there. It's 116.11, but I'll, I'll just write down 116.10. Whoa, I did not mean to do that. And while we're below 117, I... I 
I just uh, I I don't really I don't really want to put bearish, although I'm bearish intr excuse me I'm bearish intraday. Um. Well, what happened to what happened here? The dollar is just uh, look at the dollar Canadian. Dollar Canadian is just free falling. Is oh look at crude. Crude's ripping. That no, could be a reason. Huh. I don't know why the dollar Canadian is selling off pretty aggressively, but it is. So just a little heads up there. Um, cable's moving up a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not too sure what's up with that. Um, anyway. Okay. Going back to the euro. Well, we're going to get to that in just a second. So the euro, I want to put bearish, but I don't want to put bearish. I do, I do, but I still think we're in a range. So I'm going to keep it in a range just because it is ahead of the election. But just keep in mind, I think I do think it's a little bit bearish here. Um, the cable, we had a little bit of a false breakdown below the 618 retracement. Uh, if you use Forex analytics, you already knew that, you know, an hour ago. If you're, if, if you know, even if it was just, if you weren't paying attention earlier this morning, we kind of had this false breakdown, might get a spike back up towards this uh we're, we've almost filled the gap from overnight um which comes in you know i would say roughly around the 129 50 60 uh level but i do believe that this trend line is going to offer resistance and that's where key resistance is going to be which is 129.84 uh support is right here at this 128.60 I think it was 128.66, which is 618. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the Aussie. So the Aussie probed below the 70 cent level, couldn't hold. Uh, that was 66.92. So I'll just write down 66.90 as being um, support. I mean, I'll just write down 70 cents. I mean, you know, that that's obviously been pretty key. Just because we probe something by 10 or 15 pips doesn't, it just, it doesn't mean more than, you know, we're just kind of probing. So um, resistance would be, let's see, the 38% retracement comes in at 70.54. The 50% comes up with these spike highs. That comes in at 70.73. So I'm going to write that down that. 70.70 70 is really resistance for the Aussie on rallies. Kiwi, we have this confluence of support here. Um, that confluence is a, let me, let me go to an hourly and I'm gonna show you. There's, from that low right here, back in, uh, back at the end of September to the highs, that's a 618 retracement. From this last low of this trend right here, the 78% retracement came in at the same price. So that confluence was at 65.90. That is support. I think we wrote this down last week too. Um, resistance now. Be back in a minute, Blake. All right, bud. My assumption would be trend line resistance comes in around 66, 40. I'm gonna write down 66.50. This should probably offer resistance today. Okay. Dollar CAD, CAD, dollar CAD, dollar CAD. Uh, so the dollar Canadian, um, it's interesting. We had this really big sell-off that just happened over the course of the last 30 minutes. I'm not too sure why but we were at 133 and all of a sudden 
you know, we sold off pretty aggressively here. Um, this you said, Blake, uh, crude huh? went from, as you said, the crude went from almost minus 6% on the day to almost flat. So yeah, that's a big move. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that's probably what moved it. I'm not too sure, but, uh, but it was a pretty big, pretty big move in crude. Uh, let's see where we're at here because this is the previous high right here uh, that we were watching the dollar Canadian from last week. Remember, it's one thirty two fifty or one thirty two sixty. We're back at it. So let's see if it coincides with any fib levels too. Let me delete this. I'm gonna delete this. This stopped at the eighty eight percent retracement. In case you guys didn't see it, right here, right. So let's delete that and let's figure out if we have any FIB levels coming up because we may have some support right where we're currently at. Oh, oh, oh. So the 38% retracement comes in at 132.71. We're slightly below that. And the 50% retracement comes in at 132.51. So I'm gonna write that down. 132.50. So any move back up towards 133, well, probably any move right back up here towards 133.50 would, it's going to offer us resistance now. So even if we bounce here, yeah, 133.40, 133.50. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, look at crude. We were down and now we're actually, crude is actually flat on the day. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing moving crude. All right, uh, here's the dollar max. So the dollar Mexican peso, not really doing a whole lot. We're still capped by that 2150 level, which we talked about last week. Support at 2110. Still think we need to watch the dollar Canadian because, or uh, dollar Canadian, dollar Mexican peso because it's holding up really well. If if there's any sense of risk off over the course of the next next couple of days, I think you got to watch the dollar Mexican peso because if you guys recall, you know it's been finding support. This longer term support down here is pretty key. This twenty eighty you know, four, I think is what we had written down before, but it's really, it's like 2082. It's really critical. And we haven't really been able to break down. So if we get any type of risk off, this should explode. And 2154 is the 38% retracement. So So I'm going to write down 2150 as being resistance and 2110 as being support. Okay. Dollar Swiss. So the dollar Swiss continues to make its move back towards 92. Remember 92 cents has been a big resistance level. And now it's also the 618 retracement of this move lower. So I would assume that 62 cents or 92 cents, excuse me, is resistance today. Support on dips. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I don't want to give it back all the way back to 91 cents because I don't think we're going to make it there today. But this probably this breakout point here at 91 and a quarter should offer support on dips. I mean, look at how heavy the euro is. And the euro just, I mean, the euro can't even get out of its own way right now, which is kind of crazy. Um, I know we were just talking about it, but it's like, Man, I can't even hold a bid. US dollar Norwegian Krona. Now what's interesting about the US dollar Norwegian Krona is it didn't sell off, not like the dollar Canadian. So 
look, if the dollar Canadian rallies or crude oil sells off or the euro sells off, the US dollar Norwegian krona might be at risk of breaking out. It really could be. Uh, l- let's write down. I don't even want to write down these highs, right? Well, I will. Actually, it's 960, but I think if you're short US dollar Norwegian krona, you got to be really careful. Okay. Uh, dips down towards 942 should offer support or 940. Actually, I'm just going to write that down because that's what we had all week last week. Dollar index. Okay. So the dollar index, we moved past resistance here that we were monitoring last week, but I don't think that I still think we could be consolidating ahead of the election, which if you actually extend this triangle out to today's highs, right, to right here, this is a more of a symmetrical triangle versus what we had right here. So I think you could you could still argue that, hey, maybe those, those highs are it. Um, support. Is it 93.60 resistance at 94 and a quarter? All right. Um, Dollar yen. So last week, you know, we talked about how the dollar yen is just not sustaining sell-offs below 104.50. Uh, right now, we have to get above 105 in order to squeeze. But um, I, I think while we're between 104 and 105, it's just kind of a range here. I do think the dollar yen is going to move eventually. I'm just not convinced on which direction because I, I, when you look at from a correlation standpoint, it's hard to draw conclusions that the dollar yen is moving with yields or it's moving with the dollar or it's moving with risk. It, it's, it's been a, it's been tough. And, and even the guys in my office that I trade with every day, they are really, you know, kind of conflicted as well on, on, on the directionality of the, the dollar yen. So, all right, let's talk about, uh, gold and sil- or gold and the equity markets really quick and then we're going to I'm going to let the my colleagues take over. Uh, so here's the S&P. So still in this consolidation here, we're holding above, you know, I I'm, I'm going to write down 3250 as support. Resistance intraday, let's think about this for a second. I, as as I've mentioned to you guys before, I think we're going mid-range by the end of, you know, Oops, <clears throat> excuse me. We're going mid-range by tomorrow. But right now the 38% retracement is gonna come in right around that spike low. So that's gonna be at 33.55 will be the 38% retracement, okay? So support is gonna be 32.50. 3355 will be resistance. Or 3250 being the previous triangle support right here. Uh, it's actually 3260. So let's write that down because it's a rising trend line. So, and uh, let's take a look at gold really quick. So, gold, very strong. It's, it was strong on Friday. Oops. continues to hold up really well right now we are probing that tw- that uh, this remember we we're uh, i think last on on last friday we wrote down 1890 and we're here right now i'd give it a little bit further than that today Nineteen oh three is the six one eight retracement. So, 
I'm going to write down 1900 this morning, intraday, and support being back here at uh, 1875, because 1873 is a spike low here. So I'm going to say 1875 is going to be support. All right, guys. Um, Good job. Well, well, you know, it's a, it's a range and, you know, it's going to be a little challenging between now and, and, um, and tomorrow. I don't think you need to need to get really directional right now. Um, you know, just watch the ranges and try not to step into FOMO and just be careful. Right. Yeah. Home, home on the range. I know. I know. Hopefully we'll have some Trump corrections. By, by, we'll, strange. We'll, we'll be more directional by the end of the week. I think we will. So anyway, Stelio, Steve, I'm going to hand it over to you guys. Um, my time is a little off this morning because... You slept it's, longer. I slept in. And my, everybody <laughs> hear about adjusting. this it's gonna for take six me a couple months. Days to get, get, get with it. So, oh, um, I, I, yeah, I hope you'll adjust to the extra hour. <laughs> I'll see you guys on the daily <laughs> roundup. All right. Thank brother. you, Blake. All right, thanks, see you later, mate. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. Still the else. So, <laughs> so the main event is uh, the elections tomorrow. Um, no we shit. talked about it a little bit. I think it's going to be a little bit in the air. And, uh, and abortion. <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> otherwise, apart from the elections, it's a bit of the same. Um, we had some numbers, some PMIs today. Who cares about PMIs, right? They were a little bit better than expected across Europe. Um, so that's in line with kind of like a nice little recovery. We're still way below pre-COVID levels, but you know we're getting we're getting slowly higher. Um, but the the bad news is that we have uh, COVID cases rising. I don't want to say exponentially, but they're going high quite quite a lot. And there's now lockdowns. We have, we're having lockdowns in Greece and I'm reading about Italy and Spain and UK a month. So this is not good for the economy. And uh, you know, governments are going to try and subsidize this. But really, the effects are not going to be temporary, unfortunately. At least uh, part of them, I think, uh, is going to be a little bit more long lasting. So you can't, you can't really be mega bullish on anything in these circumstances. But clearly, the markets, uh, equity markets today seem to think that, uh, you know, it's okay. It's all okay. I, I read that everything is okay. Uh, yeah, everything's cool. Uh, I read the UK will be closed till the end of the year, but the Tories will push back around Christmas so people could, you know, um, sing Christmas carols. Shop, shop their COVID meds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it's even striking home, isn't it? COVID. Oh, yeah. yeah. Here, yeah. Uh, here they, they're locking down uh restaurants and gyms and everything yeah the u.s is three weeks behind but if trump wins there won't be a lockdown but do you think there will be if biden wins um i don't know but i can tell you one thing with absolute certainty it's a lot more likely nobody can doubt that yeah i mean we're almost at a hundred thousand cases a day now yeah, new highs, new yeah, highs. That's, yeah. that's scary. It is, it is unfortunate, uh, but it is what it is. Yeah. I'm dead if I get it. I. So you guys better start looking around. I, <laughs> I think that you you should try not to get it, but uh, I, I think that as an assumption, uh, it's too bleak. I don't think it's nowhere near true. Okay. I mean, thank you, you should thank you. Thank you. You shouldn't, for sure. But I feel I, better now. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't think your prognosis is as bad as you Doctor, just described. Dr. Steve has spoken there. So. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, we've I had thought cases, he was a Greek economist. He's a doctor of love. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had cases of people of over 100 years old, and you can't be over 100 years old without some health issues, right? We yeah. all agree on that. Yeah. That have recovered. <laughs> yes. Anyway, it is what it is. So let's see. It sucks. Okay, uh, I don't have much else to say. Really, tomorrow is going to be the big day. So, wait for sure, that. for sure, Stelio. Yeah. Uh, by the way, um, the huge spike in crude that, of course, you know, took yeah. with it anything that's correlated, is due to um, uh, Russia 
Um, th there is a report that uh, Russia uh, proposes uh, delaying um, um, the an, an increase of output from OPEC. So that's what caused um, the spike in crude. And that's what, of course, caused the move lower in uh, USD CAD that we see here. Um, you know, nicer rejection from the previous area, but you know that's not enough from a technical perspective to say that that's it. We're headed lower from here. I think there is still a chance that we can see a higher high before we can actually resume lower. Of course, there is also the possibility that this is like some type of a bigger triangle here. Yeah, the dollar looks like Canada. They almost look. You know, yeah. very similar, uh, not there taking is, out the prior high. Yeah. yeah, there is a possibility that we get some, we have something like this yeah. in hand. Uh, so if we do break lower from this trend line support, I think that we just headed to new lows uh, for one more uh, low, which I think inevitably will happen. The question is, have we already found this intermittent uh, high or do we need to push a little bit higher towards like 130? Uh, sorry, 136, I mean. Uh, so that, you know, that that's the question that remains to be answered from a technical perspective, in my opinion. Because in any case, no matter how you look at this, you know, um, even if we push a little bit higher or if we stay in a triangle, you know, this type of a reaction definitely isn't some kind of an impulsive um, the beginning of an impulsive move higher. Here's his USD knock as well, doing the exact same thing, retesting the previous area. So far, it's holding. Definitely the reaction from that zone, not as strong as the one we've seen in USD CAD. So, um, you know, my main case scenario remains that we uh, can easily see one more push higher. 980 and 1011 is, are the two areas I'm uh, interested in uh, selling uh, more USD knock. But I agree with what Blake said before, that for the time being, doesn't look like being short as a short-term trade, um, you know, is the place to be as we speak, if you're a short-term trader, of course, because, you know, it totally depends on, on your trading style. Now, um, Blake has already covered the main um, FX uh, pairs, just you know, to revisit here the DXY before I go to other stuff. I just want to reiterate here that, um, you know, I don't know if we should see this whole area on the chart as one big consolidation, which there is a, you know, there is a big good case to be made that it is. Um, or if we want to look at it as, as something more complex, what I can tell you with certainty, though, is that I see nothing bullish. I'm not saying that crude can continue higher towards like 95, 95, 30. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, I don't see the bullish case here. And I don't mean from a fundamental perspective, which I definitely don't. I mean, I don't see it from a technical perspective. So even if we see a short term reaction higher um, in uh, the DXY and in dollar pairs, I'm definitely remaining, um, you know, on the bearish camp. Doesn't uh, that look I... a lot like Canada that yeah. you just showed? Almost yeah, identical. It looks it looks very similar to it, and I mean, yeah. you know, that's not like a huge they're surprise. They're both dollar so pairs, right? Yeah, they're, yeah. <laughs> exactly. One uh, is a dollar index, and the other one is a dollar pair. So you know, that's not a big surprise there. Well, now, I don't know what surprises me. <laughs> I guess I, after I've maybe after I've done this for another 30, 40 years. Uh, I wish you can do it for another fifty. <laughs> now, <me. laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, going back to our favorite metals, you know, nothing really to report here. I mean, gold and silver. Uh, you know, they had a nice reaction lower last week, but I mean, especially look at gold. Has something really changed? No, nothing has nothing. really changed here. I mean, I still see a consolidation in time rather than price. And especially as long as we trade above like 1820 roughly, I don't see a bearish argument. I mean, it, it, it might push lower towards that zone in the short term, 
but you know, I wouldn't be shorting this as simple as that. Um, and I think above this trend line resistance, you know, it's gone. That's it. Uh, I, I think we're going to start seeing big moves once again to the upside and pe people are going to try to chase it higher or uh, even worse, people are going to be looking for a pullback to buy it and they might not be getting these pullbacks once it breaks higher once again. So, you know, uh, I think you, you want to trade it unless you're a, you know, a scalper or a very short term trader. You are either long or uh, on the sidelines. Uh, that, that's that's my personal point of view. Silver, more or less same case. I was really hoping to see a move towards 21, a lower low. There is still a possibility we might see um, a move towards 21. But, you know, you can't count on that. I mean, it might happen, but you can't count on that. I mean, a friend of mine was asking me the other day, you know, he, he's really got interested in buying, you know, physical silver. It's like, where should I buy it? I said, you know, you find it anywhere between 19 and 21. You, know, just, you just, you know, buy it. End of story. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my exact belief about it. Now, natural gas, you know, quite a nice reaction lower today, but, you know, we're comfortably above 290. So, you know, nothing really changes here above 290. It's like bullish. That's it. Now, crude oil, interestingly, today um, tested, actually, this is a wrong trend line now. There it is. Yeah. So, yeah, crude oil, interestingly, today uh, tested the confluence of the equality target, first leg lower, to second leg lower. Also, this horizontal support area at 34. Uh, we actually bridged through it uh, temporarily. That is That was my minimum target, right? I, I'm not saying that I like to buy at 34. If I did, I would have already bought it. I'm hoping there is more downside to it. But I'm saying that from a technical perspective, we, we've already fulfilled the minimum target for correction here. So just keep that in mind. Now, having said that, I think we need to see more um, you know, um, evidence that we've actually bottomed out. Same thing can be said here about the S&P. S&P found support in this zone once again, quite a nice reaction higher. But, you know, in order for anybody to say that we've actually bottomed out, bottomed out you know, we need to see more evidence, as simple as that, because this 3,200 and change area is, you know, is an area of support. I mean, you can clearly see it going back in the chart in the chart as well. Um, so, you know, for the time being, this whole thing can be like a bigger consolidation. Um, I think there is a very decent chance to see a rally higher without even seeing a lower low. I think that any type of scenario in which we get uh, a, a result almost directly, and the market thinks that's a very low probability scenario. As I said many days ago, I think it's a higher probability scenario than the market prices in. I think that initially it's going to be perceived as bullish from the market because people are going to be initially focused more on unpricing uh, turmoil and um, uh, you know, a period of time, who knows, it's going to be weeks at least uh, that, you know, the election result gets contested and who knows what happens. I mean, we might see, you know, uh, riots and I don't know what else, you know, during that period. So any result that's more or less definitive, I think it's initially going to perceive, be perceived by the market as bullish, you know, regardless of if it's like Trump that wins or Biden uh, that wins. So, I mean, I, I do see the possibility of not seeing a lower low here. Um, now, out of curiosity, which I almost never do, I mean, I, I, I never do since years ago. You know, as I've said, I've been reading like banks analysis on, you know, election scenarios and what they think is bullish and what they think is bearish. And to make a long story short and save you the time, I can tell you that they don't agree. I mean, there are banks that believe that Trump getting reelected is bullish, by the way. Um, common economic sense would say that that's the case. From a very simple perspective, I've said it before, from the perspective of, of corporate taxes, uh, stock prices in the present is a discounting mechanism of future income 
post taxes income, of course, for the companies and of course for the um, stockholders, right? So theoretically speaking, um, and and supposedly practically speaking, higher taxes means uh, that lower stock prices would be needed, um, you know, to make up for it. So theoretically speaking, uh, uh, Trump victories should be better for stocks if we just, you know, get isol you know, isolate the picture in um, taxes. But you know, there is, I mean, there are banks that believe that a Biden uh, win, especially the so-called blue wave, um, is is going to be very bullish because there's going to be almost no limit to stimulus. And I do agree more or less with that. I think that, um, you know, if um, you know the Democrats get everything, so you know they don't you know, need anybody else to make such decisions, I think we're going to see even more stimulus than under any scenario. I mean, I do believe we're going to be getting more stimulus no matter who wins, Trump or Biden, no matter who gets the Senate, because I think that everybody agrees that there is, you know, no chance uh, that the House um, of Representatives just, you know, switches uh, to um, Republicans. Um, we're, we're going to get a lot of stimulus, but I think we're going to get even more if uh, you know, um, uh, Democrats have the Congress and, of course, the uh, White House. So you know, a lot of banks believe that it's all about the stimulus, which you know it might as well be, at least you know until it stops working. Um, so you know, I don't want to make any predictions because really you can't be certain. I think the only certain predictions are that a contested result is going to be short-term negative, uh, a contestable, let's say, result is going to be short-term negative, and a result that's going to be definitive is going to be at least short-term positive. I think these are the only two things we can be cer certain about. Everything else, I think we have to wait and see, and frequently in these events, and I'm going to um, you know, close this chapter with that, frequently in these events, the, f the initial reaction is the wrong reaction. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, like I'm, 2016. Yeah, but I'm not saying that only due to 2016. And you know that better than anybody, Dale, because you've you've been around for many big events. Uh, it was pretty I mean, quiet after Lincoln won re-election. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, man. All right, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was a good one. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think you know you you have to be patient, and I think that trying to make a killing uh, on election night can work out or kill your account. So, you know. Yeah. It's up for you to decide if, that, if that's the kind of trading you want to do. Uh, personally, I would strongly advise against it because, as I said, you can either make a killing or get killed. Um, so, you know, uh, I think it's better to stay safe and, you know, see what's actually going to happen and then reassess than, you know, try to become rich overnight. Because I've seen that happen fre very frequently. And especially, yeah. it's human psychology. I've seen a lot of people be very aggressive with the way they trade when it is to trade in favor of their candidate. So if their market thesis goes along with, for example, their favorite candidate like winning, I, I, I see that they frequently are more aggressive. And I think that, you know, having to do with trading, this is not a thing or a night you should be, you know, working on emotion. Uh, I, I really think that it's, you know. Prudence over valor. Yeah, the, total, uh, the totally wrong approach. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay if you do nothing until the dust settles, right, bro? Yep. And as DJ says, bulls make money, bears make money, pigs get slaughtered, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to get a lot of people getting slaughtered, you know, on election night. Unfortunately, as I said, in every big event, you get a lot of people that get slaughtered. Um, so at least, you know, <laughs> begin and try to, to begin the night by making sure you're not going to be one of those getting slaughtered. 
Um, so let me see what else we need to cover. Let me go through some of your questions. Uh, natural gas, we did talk about that. Platinum, we didn't talk about that. Who do we have for an interview today, by the way? Mystery uh, Trader 99. Oh, okay. You we know his, uh, yeah, you know his thesis about parody. Yes, yes, that uh, that in essence, um, FX pairs will gravitate. Right. The, the major ones will gravitate all towards parity, which of for course the... implies implies a very strong dollar. Right. It should, yeah. Yeah, which. Yeah, it would. Yeah, which, as you know, I don't agree with. I know. Nothing is impossible, and I'm open to change. I mean, if I see a technical move that you know shows me something you know totally different, you know, I'm I'm not going to be losing my money just because my fundamental thesis is for a weaker dollar. But for the time being, I really don't see the ingredients in the mix to get a strong dollar move. If something changes, you're going to be the first ones to know. I mean, if something changes in my perspective, you're going to be the first ones to know. Yeah, I think the real batter, battleground, should the dollar extend this move, would be in the 96 to 97 range. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, but the for the time ground. being, yeah. I don't see anything bullish uh, looking at the dollar. And the major uh, dollar pair. So, you know, I have no reason to subscribe to such a theory, but, you know, that's what makes a market, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's very healthy. I mean, I've seen people that I disagree with make tons and tons of money. So, you know, let's find out. Um, having to do with platinum, I, I, I see a corrective move here. For example, metals is one thing that, definitely doesn't point to dollar strength, right? No matter which metal you look at, platinum, palladium, copper, nickel, uh, silver, gold, I mean, all of them point to dollar weakness. So, you know, that's something I take seriously into account. Uh, let's see what else we have. Nifty and bug Nifty. Nothing has changed since the last time you asked, my friends. Uh, Nifty, here it is, near the highs. Um, you know, what type of a correction we have. Initially, it looked like a triangle. It might not be a triangle. It might be like a bull flag. But for the time being, this correction looks more or less, you know, th this move looks more or less like a correction. Bank Nifty. Approaching resistance once again, so be careful with that. USD INR. There it is. Be careful here as well. Um, you know, retesting this previous support area as resistance. So let's pay attention to this so far. I'm not seeing this move higher being impulsive. So, you know, um, I think there is still a chance that we're going to see it turn uh, to the downside. So, you know, that's all I have to say about it. Use the uh, ruble, by the way, since we were talking about the deal, um, you know, on its way higher, as we've said before, the, you know, key area of resistance is like 82, 80, let's say, uh, you know, towards 83, that's going to be like a major, major area because above that, we trigger like a massive, massive cup and handle formation. You know, I'm, uh, as I've said before, from a macro perspective, I'm looking to be uh, long the, Rus uh, the Russian uh, ruble for a long period of time, but I don't have the technical confirmation yet. So, you know, I have a thesis, but I don't have something that will get me, um, you know, um, triggering a short position. If we do see a rejection, though, and a turn lower, and we break through this red channel, you know, that can change things. We did break the red channel before, but that's why, you know, it's not only price, but it's also structure. I mean, there's, there was no way I would sort a move that unfolded lower in such a corrective manner. Um, so as I've said before, it's about having specific levels, but also paying attention to how price develops. 
because you know there is a way you can break through a level and there is a very very different way you can break through a level anyhow is your is your guest here uh, dale because we're already five minutes past the top of the hour yeah and my guitar is out of tune yes he is oh mystery, okay mystery trader is here and we're going to unveil his mystery today I'm going to Alex. I'm going to make you a panelist. And I'm going to ask you to unmute. Welcome back, Mystery. Hey, Dale. How's it going? Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, brother. How are you? How have you been, Alex? Perfect. Doing good. Good to hear your voice again. Yeah, yours too, man. So, uh, you know, uh, you could go ahead and share your screen and I know that you've been uh, approaching this as a continuum of your narrative of dollar parity uh, with a lot of different currencies, everything moving towards that uh, uh, $1, uh, even all currencies kind of in the same place before a reset. Is that still um, the narrative that you're, you know, have conviction about? That is, yes. Um, okay. Let me see. I just want to make sure I'm sharing my screen correctly. Can you, you got see it. Now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you okay. Go. It looks like you have prepared a nice little PowerPoint. I'm going to stop interrupting and let you go through it, bro. No, not at all. Uh, so today, obviously, is a um, special day. Obviously, it's the day before the U.S. election. So I kind of want to do a bit of an election special. Um, you know, normally I'll talk for an extended period of time, but I thought this time, you know, I'd, I'd make it a little bit more brief. We'd go over all the currencies together and then towards yeah. the end, we'd kind of discuss, you know, I, I get a lot of questions about what about potential outcomes of, you know, Biden election. versus Trump. Yeah. So we kind of yeah. like make it more of an election kind of more interactive and more of a discussion. Uh, so feel okay. free to, to interject at any time you want to, okay, um, buddy. we get started, but, uh, yeah, so let's get started here. Um, this is obviously part five of the global Forex parity. Um, I still believe that everything is starting to line up um, as before, but in order, let's let's recap what happened in part four. Uh, some of the things that were predicted, some that came true, some that did not. Uh, first and foremost was obviously there a potential major currency reversal I predicted last time would happen potentially somewhere between October 2nd and October 30th. Uh, we did start to see a bit of a, a Europe top, macro top forming and a uh, DXY bottom starting to form. Um, it did hold that big uh, tenure channel, uh, which I'll show here in a bit, um, yeah. but it managed to hold, uh, which was our first sign of confirmation, but there still needs to be more follow-up, but we'll kind of go through right. that in a second. And then there'd be some sort of equity market weakness before the election. Uh, some of the potential catalysts could have been by leading the polls or COVID second wave. You know, both of those appear to be coming true. Um, the one thing that did not as of right now is gold it hasn't run up past its previous high. I'll explain in detail why it hasn't. And then obviously um, Brexit, Brexit and Italy, even all these other sovereign crises, whatever you want to call them. So far, they haven't had any material impact yet. Uh, and they seem to be, there's no real um, uh, sovereign issues yet. So that didn't happen. So but let's go over yeah, the- I, uh, I interviewed a guy who thinks uh, the epicenter is going to be out of Italy. Are you seeing the same thing because of the <laughs> Italian banks? Uh, and, I mean, and, and politically, uh, yeah, Italy is what you call it. So yeah, I call it Italy. Yeah, it's kind I of like that. Uh, so <laughs> you see that happening uh, well, next year? Um, out of the three, it it may potentially be the weakest. I, I don't know if they've also had a, been hit really hard with the um COVID. with the coronavirus as well. I'm yeah. sure that's had a, a larger economic material impact as well. I mean, they used to they used to be the epicenter for COVID. Yeah. So obviously, that was yeah. that's a big part of it. So. Uh, Right now, I think it's still too early to tell. Okay. Uh, but today, I think recently, I think just news this morning that uh, Britain and Euro European Union are starting to have some compromise. So maybe it, it may not be Brexit of those three. That's probably the, the least of the three as of right now. But I mean, that okay. can change at any moment. Um, so we'll go over the uh, four major currency pairs um, in the Forks update. First and foremost, this is the uh, Euro dollar. Obviously, this is, uh, you know, the downward uh, bear channel continues to hold. Um, last time we came, it was this um, full green candle that had just gone up and touched that upper uh, channel boundary. And then we had an initial reaction back below the 200 day moving, 
200 monthly moving average. And then now as of Friday, which the month closed, uh, October, uh, it formed a red inverted hammer. So as of right now, uh, stochastics are also peaking above the 80 level. Um, and for most part right now, as of right now, it appears that this channel boundary is holding. Now, some people say, well, what about when you compare it to the previous 200 day, 200 monthly moving uh, average rejection, it then had a secondary move higher. And they say, is that possible? I mean, in theory it is. If it does, it would negate the entire bear channel and it would actually put the you know, global forex parity. That was a right great there. call on that inflection point up there. Thank you. I, I actually have to give you credit, Dale. Every time you invite me on, something big is about to happen. So it's okay. actually your, your your planning is actually the one that I have to give full credit to. Uh, I'll take it. Coincidence <laughs> is my friend. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, every time I appear to come on, there seems to be some sort of macro inflection point. But uh, this one was no different. Yeah, and it not only was it the... Uh, potential uh, bottoming on bond yields, which I called two days prior last time, it actually did happen. Yeah, but, we were on the same page on that. Yeah, and then uh, and then uh, this, but this also did form. And it, 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 I, up until that rejection started happening, none of this was, you know, potentially verified. So there still needs to be more confirmation and I'll kind of go over it here in a little bit, but this is the first step of uh, ensuring some sort of next move down can happen. So is that last candle you have up there, a monthly candle that's completed, that's October? Yes, that was as of Friday. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something I use. It's pretty powerful. It's a two candle reversal. So okay. if you just count back from the candle that we're on right now would probably be a November candle Correct. that you're not showing. Correct. And then you just count back two candles, mm -hmm. see where it closed on the month that's going to be um, your reversal. Okay, so that's going to take in, you know, eight weeks of, to the left of price action. Correct. So above that price, uh, if we close above that it, by the end of November, I don't know what that close was. That would, then this would have been essentially a, a bull flag, correct? Yeah, like a, uh, uh, you know, two month reversals, what you had. Yeah, uh, we'll uh, close in October. I still believe, uh, and I'll go through it towards the end, but I remember the last time I showed a, a, a bell curve and it kind of showed the historical mean average of all the topping periods and how many weeks and it took. And that's how I came up with that October 2nd to October 30th um, uh, peak window. But I've, I went back and I looked back and every major dollar bottom and euro top had a secondary back test that went back and retested that one last time, um, typically after uh, uh, two full um, uh, a monthly contracts that expired and they'll, they'll touch it once more and then the final trend will confirm. So I still think there should be one more pop up here on Euro, even if we have a, a, a downturn here. So uh, it may be potentially a little bit early still with a lot of election volatility and a lot of other things going on. It may be kind of the catalyst to kind of have one more pop here. Yeah, I'm thinking of trying the long side around your um, two moving averages that converge are about 114 or so if we get uh, down there. Yeah, I think uh, for now, I think um, if we were to see a, a euro uh, kind of confirmation retop, it would have to be at a, a descending, it would have to be a lower high. And if it were to see some sort of rejection at a lower high in the just above uh, 119, uh, kind of 119 to 119 four, somewhere in that range, if we kind of see a top somewhere, or maybe 119.6, somewhere in that range, yeah. then that would be a signal, okay. This could be potentially be an actual that that final macro rejection, okay. um, and that would happen somewhere between November thirteenth and November twentieth. That's kind of the, the tightest window I can give. Uh, I, if it, I have uh, someone else I interviewed was talking about November fourteenth. Yeah, for, I'm, I'm seeing a lot cycle. of uh, I'm seeing a lot of activity in um, post election. There'll be a post election calm. I think a lot of people are betting insane volatility. I think it's actually going to be you know neither up nor down. I think maybe we could have some kind of a a pause or reprieve and then all of a sudden mid-november so i'm seeing a lot of signs something big is gonna happen in mid-november okay so uh, that's just what i'm seeing in the data who, who knows what the catalyst could be but um right. it could be a lot of other things okay and so the next uh the next chart is going to be the uh, pound dollar um on this one uh, it's still holding the um 13 day moving average support but it went up and rejected last time we spoke it was um uh it was trying to break through the 50-day, sorry, 50-monthly moving average, uh, but then it rejected back down. 
uh, very similar to this period in the uh, previous green box. You see it and try to break out to the 50 many times. It just it failed to do so. Um, if this pattern is to rep repeat exactly again, which is no guarantee, but if it were to, then in theory, it suggests there may be one more uh, drawdown to the magenta. But given how close we are to this purple line, I still think it may just try and go ahead and reject it now if it does, which would be that last kind of pop I talked about on Euro. In theory, you should have you know, a similar pop on the pound uh, if we can get up there. Um, okay. But as of, as of right now, there's no, the race to parity has not begun until, you know, this 13 day moving average, 13 monthly moving average right here uh, fails. So for now, uh, bulls are in control at the moment, all, barely, but they are in the controls. So uh, until that kind of uh, 129 levels, you know, starts to show weakness, uh, it, so far, so good. Okay. And then on the pound euro, I know most people do euro pound, but obviously I like to do the inverted uh, to kind of show in correlation with the rest of the theory um, that this major macro orange trend line continues to hold. Uh, it keeps getting pounded, but as of this point, it's still holding. So until that fails as well, um, you know, there's no there's no race to parity yet that has begun. But if you look back here to the 07, 08 period, um, you know, it, it kept hitting it over and over again and eventually it ended up failing. Um, and even, oh, sorry, I apologize. Um, and even on the, um, if you look here on the, uh, uh, on the MACD, cross. That, uh, that, yeah, it crossed bearish and it did cross, it crossed bearish at the center line, which is very important. It's often a major macro uh, bearish reversal. So we're seeing the same thing here uh, as of right now. So as of right now, it's saying there should be further weakness, but at, currently at the moment, uh, I think we're getting one last possible dead cat bounce maybe. And then yeah. we'll see, we'll see from there. Okay. So, but the most important part of the entire global forex parity thesis is that the pound has to, by definition, fall faster than the euro. So this pair, this pair needs to keep trending lower, and that needs to fail in order for any sort of, you know, uh, global parity to happen. And just for our viewers, uh, Alex has it paired the opposite way that we trade retail Correct. euro pound. Correct. Okay. It's only ahead, to buddy. tie in with the rest of the, the thesis, obviously. Okay. Um, and then this is the. Um, the dollar monthly chart and as you can see here clearly this uh long-term purple uh 10-year trend line uh continues to hold and i said last time when i was on that uh lower bollinger overshoots on the monthly chart are extremely rare uh and the reason why i was so confident it was going to reverse is when i came on last time we were right here like the red had been touching the purple and yeah. it, it seemed like you know dollar was doomed but i was extremely confident that a bounce was coming because it's only happened one other time in the last you know, 20 years. You know, even here, it just touched. But this is actually the only real over, other lower Bollinger Band overshoot that we had. And obviously, it bounced off there. So I, I knew at some point there had to be some sort of a relief rally on the dollar. Um, and it also did bounce off roughly the uh, 200 monthly moving average as well, too, uh, inter, inter month. So as of right Good now, it, yeah, it, it formed a, a nice green bullish uh, hammer as of Friday's close on last month. Yeah. Yeah, um, we uh, we should still see if you look here, the 13 mo moving in the in the 50 are starting yeah. to converge and get real narrow. It did the same exact thing here uh, during the 2014 period, but they never actually crossed. But it did kind of get stuck in this consolidation pattern for a while. I don't think it's going to last as long as this time based on kind of the activity I'm seeing. I think it'll be a little bit faster. But nonetheless, if you see there's always a red, green, red and green and kind of that kind of red, green, red, green. So it would suggest that we still have one more back test as well on the DXY to confirm this is a bottom. Um, and you're even seeing that kind of red green, red green pattern here as well too. So I, I still think there's one more retest of that kind of call it mid 92 level range, um, okay. possibly maybe some volatility or something, or maybe, you know, hypothetically, whoever wins, they say, Oh, stimulus. There's this kind of immediate stimulus euphoria, which may not pan out. And so if you see some kind of, all of a sudden you stimulus euphoria over the next couple of weeks after the election, but then, you know, we get this drop back down, but then all of a sudden reality sets in that would then establish uh, that kind of secondary or, or tertiary bottom that we need to kind of move back up. So from there on, uh, we're going to go to the Bitcoin. Obviously Bitcoin's had a lot of activity since the last, uh, uh, last time we spoke, uh, last time we spoke, it broke out of that initial purple macro trend line. Uh, it popped up back up. I added these two uh, macro, 
uh, uh, resistance levels. This is the roughly 12,000 level or just above it. This has been a major resistance going back uh, for quite some time. Um, it bounced off, it rejected off there, and then it's held this key magenta support. And then now it's broken through all the way up to the uh, 14,000 level, which is actually where it, it peaked in July of 2019. So it's actually having a very healthy breakout. Uh, a lot of it's uh, on the back of obviously some dollar weakness, um, but it's actually uh, it's actually performing really well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I made the comment earlier, Mystery, that uh, with risk off and a strong dollar and even weaker metals, the relative strength was in crypto last week. It actually was. Yeah, the last two weeks. This, this is a weekly candle. So, yeah. so these this two weeks period. Uh, really had a, had a lot of strength um now with dxy potentially bottoming here you know could this green hold you know this is a previous rejection level that's a possibility you know it's already I think at the so upper, it's at the upper bollinger right now so this it, temporarily it's kind of being capped but could you see a pullback to nine grand that's kind of what i'm looking for for me uh that's right where the close right right around the 50 moving average on the weekly so yeah i could entirely see that that's, that's not okay. kind of the question um, right, uh but yeah so this is you know, obviously, um, it's good for crypto, but at, at the same time, if, if we do get some set of some kind of a huge dollar ramp, that would weigh on basically all commodities, including crypto commodities. So it's, it's the same. I kind of bunch them in with the same category now. Um, so, but for now, it's doing strong. So the real key level is fourteen thousand. That's your real kind of line in the sand. If it can really build enough bullish pressure to break out, then then you know it may have more to go. But if it puts any sort of topping tail on a closing basis this week then you, you you'll know maybe maybe time to kind of lock in some of those gains yeah okay. uh bond updates uh u.s treasury yields last time we spoke uh actually was actually the purple arrow that was the the week we spoke and sure enough yeah. it was exactly where it bottomed i said two days prior we had that kind of 40 basis point low and i said to me that looks like that's going to be a, sh a short-term bottom just because the lower bollinger was so flat and i said that was the real reason of course that ended up holding. We're seeing a very similar uh, MACD pattern back to kind of 2012. Um, and I'll actually discuss this in a little bit. I, I did some uh, QE analysis from uh, quantitative easing, but you can kind of see this kind of ABC macro pattern. You had a big A wave and then a yeah. B wave rejection of the 50 and then down to the bottom. We kind of have the same pattern. We had an A wave, a B wave rejection, roughly around the 50 moving average, and then back down. So now it's in this kind of choppy bottoming pattern, but it can be stuck here for, I mean, over a year. This one lasted from July to July. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we still have plenty of time, given how this one started roughly March, April. You know, th this could actually go into the spring, but it did have one final rejection at the 50 moving average before it came back down and then started to, you know, so we still have a bit of ways to go. I did say at, at that time that I thought it was going to be relatively lower for longer, uh, um, uh, but that if there was a, a breakout to the upside, it would indicate indicate that inflation was actually starting to seep into the system and starting to kind of leak into the system. And anytime you, you have that, um, that secondary bond yield spike, you know, that'll often hit big tech, which obviously it did in the past week or so. Uh, and it, it can hit other asset classes um, uh, because sometimes, you know, people view rising bond yields. Yield, as a, yeah. Oh, yeah, yields, not bonds, yeah. bond yields yeah. as a yeah. possible um, uh, warning signal. Uh, as of right now, there is some inflation leaking to the system, but as of right now, I still think it's going to be relatively depressed um, in the short I, term. I, but I mean, it, we look for the reasons. Couldn't it just, could it be with what, what has gone on and really the Fed is the main buyer? of treasuries across the whole curve uh auctions haven't gone well so they have not been very be stellar de no. demand uh you know it could we could have rates rise just because there's poor demand for more supply coming on the market right correct and so my contrarian thesis to that is if if in fact and i'll get into this later but depending on who wins the election it will have an, a material impact on the timing of bond yields, because if stimulus for whatever reason gets delayed after the election, that's when you would see yields come back down um, because then it would imply that the new issuance is not coming as rapidly as it originally anticipated because right now everyone's pricing and basically guaranteed stimulus right after the election, no matter who wins, which to me, I actually don't think that's necessarily gonna, gonna happen depending on the outcome, which obviously we don't know right now. But for now, 
it's still going to be below the kind of uh, 100 basis point level for some time. Uh, okay. And I still think there'll be at least another rejection if we get back up there. Um, and uh, keep NACD is still rising kind of similar to how it did in 12. Yeah. Um, and, you know, QE2 was in uh, was uh, late 2011. And then by mid 2012, QE3 happened. And then, then it started to come back out. So I, I really like... Uh the way you go back in time to find market analogs. And I uh, just want to say that uh, you're a hardworking guy to spend the time to go back in history, trading history, to find these things. Um, I know it takes time. And you do. I appreciate it. Do it, it is so. it is a lot of work. It's a lot of number crunching. It's a lot of yeah. back testing. It's so, a lot of... So but, uh, one thing I'll know. say about you, you're not lazy. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. I really appreciate it. Um, but I think uh, I, I like to look at historical analogs because ultimately, on a short-term basis, a lot of it's noise anyway. So the longer your time frame, the more you can kind of filter out a lot of that noise. And more importantly, um, human nature ultimately doesn't change in the long run. Yeah, you know, we're very same. I mean, we're going through a pandemic that's literally following the exact same trajectory curve that it did in 1918, even though Technology's changed, healthcare changed, everything changed. But what happened? You had initial primary first spike, then you had a lull you know, during the summer months, and then the second spike was actually much larger than the first, and then that ended up being the really big one. And, and sure right. enough, like that's exactly what's happening in Europe now. Considering all the things that have changed, ultimately human nature hasn't changed. So to me, I, when you look at these long-term historical analogs, I think you get kind of more of a uh, you're able to filter out the noise a lot better and just, you know, focus on the actual data. So that's why I like to go look back in history and especially with momentum indicators, because it kind of gives you a sneak peek. Okay. What happened the last time momentum indicators were doing this? And that kind of gives you, you know, so, at least some basis to go on. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And then, so then we'll do a gold update. Uh, I actually made a lot of changes this time. Um, this was the previous chart I showed last time, but it didn't have any of the actual QE lines. So these vertical lines are actually to give a bit of a historical basis on, you know, now we're in a very uh, liquid kind of quantitative easing phase in the, in the economic cycle. And when QE1 first started, which was back in uh, December 08, um, this is what happened to gold. And it, 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 you could it clearly see from there, it really started to run and have a huge spike. And then QE2 uh, was right around um, late 2010. I think it was about late November, uh, November 25th, 2010. And then from there, you saw gold have a secondary boost. QE, QE2 actually ended a month before gold actually peaked, but it ended up actually marking the top of the cycle. And then during this period, you know, they were talking about QE taper, this and that. Well, yeah. QE3 actually ended up happening right where this final spike is uh, in roughly September uh, of 2012. Um, uh, but it, you can see it was actually a buy the rumor, sell the news event. It actually ended up peaking once QE3, even though QE3 had just started. By the time QE3 ended, what happened, you know, ultimately to the gold price, it took a big hit. So this is kind of showing the, the impacts of quantitative easing and stimulus on gold's pricing. Um, and if you, Compare that to now, you know, this is where QE, QE4, which is what I'm calling it, uh, started was obviously back in roughly in kind of the March time frame. Uh, it's actually right here. So where it peaked here and then it bottomed at the 13 uh, moving average, that's actually where it officially passed. I just moved the line over a little bit so you can actually see it. Um, so, but you can see what happened. But it, it's important to note that QE4 was. Uh, many magnitude times larger than QE1 and th three combined. Right. Uh, so the, the, although it's had a great run and it's had a great move, um, it's been relatively muted compared to um, what, what it had been historically. And as of after the, the previous time I was on, I started seeing some odd signals that it's possible on the interim term and in the medium term, if the global forex parity starts to actually pan out here and DXY has its final macro bottom, gold is going to face a period of softening. It's not the end of the bull. It's not the end of the world. And I'll show in the next chart uh, on a mathematical basis. But it is important to note that you know there are these periods where it, there is kind of a cooling and softening before you have that kind of next surge back up. And if we look at the MACD here, it's actually starting to peak out roughly around the same level it did last time. Um, and if you also coincide 
with uh, the RSIs, the three RSI peaks in the red circles, those all marked major either you know medium term or interim term peaks in gold before it had some sort of protracted consolidation. Now, last time I thought that if if the 50 daily moving average had held while DXY was getting that you know secondary bounce and there was a, a final a second pullback, that that would be enough to kind of launch it up all the way to 2237. But right now, it doesn't look like at least on this cycle that it, it may happen as of yet. But Anything can happen. If, if there's more stimulus, then yes, that's enough to, to ramp it back up to that upper blue line. But really, I've been saying on Charge Coast for some time now, without that secondary stimulus, uh, gold is at risk of a pullback. It really needs that you know, fiscal stimulus to, to come through in order to really push it up to that final, final target. But as of right now, it is starting to show some signs of, of softening here Sorry. Um, uh, in the short term. And then in this next chart, this is actually the gold DXY ratio, uh, which I showed last time, but this time I kind of added some new, um, um, here's the new um, line that I added. This is actually the 22.5 resistance. When we spoke last time, it was just about to clip this blue line. It was just before it did. So that was back in August 11th. And this has been a historical major uh, resistance going back. You know, it, it topped here one, two, three, four, five times. Uh, on a closing basis. Uh, you make anything out of it, Alex, that, in, um, that gold has surpassed a 2011 high and this ratio is a lower high? Uh, that's actually what I was about to say is that if you look, the RSI peaked, had huge peaks at all these three, and then they ended up pulling back. Now, taking a step back, the reason why I'm showing this ratio is if, if global forex parity is going to happen, which I, I believe it is, I genuinely believe it is happening, you're going to have to have a softening period during that huge DXY ramp. Uh, and in or, during that period, this ratio will especially get hit hard because it's a ratio of dollar versus the DXY. So you, not only is gold going to be going down, but dollar will be spiking. So you'll have some sort of a, a aggressive pullback. But I believe after DXY hits 109, when it gets up there, roughly that level, that high 100s, that it's going to actually be the the best entry longer term for a super super bull in gold. Because at that point, I do believe that's when you're going to have to finally, you know, the reaper is going to come uh, for all this debt monetization. At a certain point, gold is going to have to rebalance. But as I said in the last few uh, presentations, until there's a unified global currency the U.S. will not allow the dollar hegemony to be challenged by having gold go vertical. So uh, it's not until you have some kind of, you know, fixed global singular monetary unit that gold will actually be able to trade freely. So until that happens, next spring, uh, <laughs> it's I think we're going to have the laughing? ramp. Well, I think we're going <laughs> to have the ramp up to 2021, but I don't think the actual that that huge bull is really going to start until 2022. So I think okay. it's going to it's going it's to be pushed off. I think a little bit further or late, right. maybe late 2021, maybe Q3, Q4. But but it's it's not going to happen right away. It's going to take some time for that dollar ramp to happen. But okay. if you notice here, if that is that theory, it could actually be a very similar pattern to what we have here, where our 08 it had a big pullback back down during that huge yeah. ramp, and then it really rocketed up. So to me, right. That's, I think this is actually a great analog for what we could actually be going through. And we may actually be going, if you look, there's a red shooting star here. Uh, yeah. You know, there may be some sort of a, a, a softening period in the interim term while that dollar ramp happens. And then that's this entry down here is where I kind of, is kind of an analog to what I would view that late 2021, early 2022 macro bottom before it really just starts ripping. Um, so this is kind of on a more macro time sense. Now, for those that are short-term traders, the only reason I bring that up is just, you know, be, be weary that, it, you know, make sure you have your stops in place because there is a possibility we do have some sort of a, a softening pullback. And every, you know, RSIP did result in at least, a, at minimum, a pullback to the 13 moving average, if not the Bollinger Center. And if you look where that is, you know, it, the ratio would definitely be much lower. And it could even pull back all the way to, this kind of 15, uh, 15 level, which is the 50 moving average. Um, and if we did, and we did a reverse calculation and you did gold, you know, reverse calculate it. If, if DXY hits 109 and it gets back to a, a, a mid 15s, you're looking at a, you know, a low 1700, 17, 
twenty, seventeen forty, somewhere in there. So it's not necessarily going to be a catastrophic pullback, but it is. You you could have you know a, a more substantial pullback. Okay. And then how does this all kind of tie in together? And I actually made a lot of updates on this final chart. Um, this is actually uh, kind of shows the entire um, d dollar bull channel, but then I, I overlaid every single gold peak and trough to kind of give some relative perspective. Cause a lot of people say, you know, they say, are you, you think, you know, the DXY is going to go one lines. I mean, dollars going to go to $500. Like, no, of course not. So I try to put these last time I came on, I said that the gold had officially broken the DXY inverse relationship on a direct basis, which is actually, I added this new vertical red line up and everything before this red line was essentially everything was starting to make kind of mathematical sense. But after that, things have kind of skewed as, as gold really has started to kind of resurge um, in the global monetary order. But if we look here, the, the previous all time high was at 1920 uh, back in uh, 2011. Then we had a kind of a bounce. And then when it retested this, when the dollar, the DXY retested this um, a bull channel support, uh, which was the 2014 bottom, gold was by that point had already dropped back down to 1346. Now this huge DXY ramp up all the way to the, at that time was one oh about 100 roughly. Yeah. Um, it looks massive, but on a gold basis, it actually only hit a gold $300, almost exactly. So yeah. it went from about 1346 to 1050. Yeah. And, th and then from there. That was it. Yeah, that was it. And then from there, from 1050, once gold had this, you know, a pullback uh, to the bottom of the channel, roughly, not quite, but close to the bottom of the channel, it went back to roughly 1360. So that's when it was in that kind of five year consolidating pattern. Uh, right. It kept kind of chopping around there for five years below 1350, 1360. And then once gold, once the DXY started spiking again, it dropped back down to about 1160. But then from here, if you look, all of a sudden from 1160, the DXY kept going up, but gold just went vertical to 1730. So this is kind of where the relationship broke. So everything before kind of mid 2019 uh, and after 2019, you kind of have to compare with a grain of salt. They're not really, it's apples and oranges. Um, but what the reason why I'm showing this is, well, we recently, you know, pulled back from 17 or went from 1730 all the way to 2100, but even just in this small secondary bounce, we're already back to, you know, in the 1880s right now. So you can kind of see like the same pattern forming, you know, could, if gold, you know, or the DXY runs all the way up to um, a high one, uh, one, you know, 109, 110 kind of level. Well, you could probably expect at least a, a 300, 400, maybe $500 uh, dollar drop from the, Af from the recent peak, but don't spe expect much more than that. You know, I think it's kind of putting it. perspective, but even the, the middle magenta line right now is already at a 103. So that kind of shows you, there is now a lot of, there's a huge window to the upside that's potentially setting up here. But it's important to know, you know, like during this period, all commodities across the board are going to face, you know, headwinds, um, you know, some more than others. Um, but a lot of the base metals uh, could potentially get hit, uh, maybe some of the agricultural commodities. So you got to really be careful from a commodities basis. But the reason why I'm showing this is if we get, you know, if this pans out and we end up having this huge 2014 style ramp all the way yeah. up to the top of the channel, this is where this top of this channel is where you want to be loading up on all kinds of commodities. Yeah. Cause that, that's going to be a long-term uh, uh, risk reward reversal uh, back to the downside for the dollar, but upside for commodities. So I think as of right now, this is kind of, you know, we're, we're if you look at the MACD here, we're seeing a very similar pattern. We had a long, kind of yeah. this sign consolidation and then it fell below and then we had a bull cross and this is where the consolidation happened before it started to run. What uh, a great was, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. I appreciate it. Um, and Hi, we also you ever got applause? <laughs> anyway, uh, my trading warrior brother really um, he could be your best. No, so so and one quick thing. So in this um, lower um, uh, stochastic it also bottomed here when that started yeah. to happen. So we're seeing a lot of confluence that this is going to happen. And then I was going to say, this is the chart I saw last time, which just showed the historical kind of bell curve average of all the Euro tops and dollar bottoms. And the average between nine and 17 weeks, we're kind of slowly starting to approach that kind of 12 to 13 range. Uh, so could we get a couple more weeks? Yeah, it's possible, but we are getting close to some sort of a, a macro uh, inflection point here soon. 
And then last bit is the election part. I just want to do a potential, uh, you know, again, full disclaimer. I'm, I don't have any political biases. I'm not a Republican or Democrat. I'm not a libertarian. I'm not any independent or anything. I just, to me, I, 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 I'm not a political person, but it is important to understand the political implications or what impacts, impacts they'll have on financial markets. So I'm going to cover both completely dispassionately, but to show what are the potential outcomes if one or the other wins. And so again, this is purely just a hypothesis, but this is what I believe would happen if Trump were to win, it would actually be the cleanest of the two outcomes because more than likely stimulus would come faster than if Biden won. Um, commodity sectors would definitely get a boost um, because I believe um, that stimulus would be coming faster. And anytime stimulus comes, all commodities, like a rising tide lifts all boats, it, it would push all commodities up. Uh, there wouldn't be any chance of a contested election like 2000, so it would kind of eliminate that, that market risk. Um, there wouldn't be a lame duck period for them to stall further stimulus. Um, it would be more risk on for equity markets, I believe, uh, as markets would kind of not quite a repeat of 2016, but it would definitely be a, a positive um, uh, tailwind for the markets. Uh, in many ways, it would be kind of business as usual as it has been. Um, the risks are, you know, maybe some social issues. There might be some riots or something due to some disgruntled voters. Uh, and there would definitely be more DXY initial softness than Biden because that perceived um, faster uh, arrival of any sort of stimulus. Now, if Biden were to win, I think it's actually short term, it may be uglier of the two options, but after his inauguration, it would actually potentially be better. But initially, you know, you get uh, maybe the first week or two, you may get a pop, but it'll fade after. Uh, I do see some, some sort of piecemeal stimulus possibly being passed between him the election and if he were to be elected it'd be inauguration uh but that's a two and a half month period and that's an eternity in financial markets mm -hmm. um i i do believe democrats uh, it, they'll control the house i don't think they're gonna get the senate but um i think they would more than likely delay any major you know multi-trillion dollar stimulus until he got in because they would want to give him credit they wouldn't want to wouldn't want to give it to Trump. So they'd probably do some sort of piecemeal band-aids just to kind of hobble it over the finish line until he gets in. The bigger risk though, is if he wins, how does President Trump react? You know, does, would he actually try and do a contested election like 2000? Yes. And that's, <laughs> that, that is the consensus and probably an accurate one. I, I think uh, for those of us that you know old enough to be, we're trading at the time. I remember vividly, uh, my mentor at the time, actually, the one who taught me uh, everything, he said, uh, Alex, watch this. Uh, if if this goes contested, it's going to really hit markets. And sure enough, that ultimately was really the pin that pricked the bubble that was the dot-com. It, it wasn't uh, anything financial. I mean, everyone says PE ratios, and yes, they were sky high. But really, it was the contested election that was causing a lot of um, uh, unknowns and kind of there wasn't any certainty in the marketplace. And that's what caused ultimately for it to eventually roll over. And the big difference, buddy? Is that Gore took a bullet for America? He did. He did. I mean, he took a I, bullet. Yeah, I mean, he did okay. You know, it, yeah. you know, worked out for him. No, um, I think I don't think, I don't think our, Yeah, yeah, hmm. he, he probably did financially. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think that um, Trump is Gore. No, no, I, I think it's uh, contested. So no, he won't. He won't. He won't lay down more than likely. But hypothetically if this were scenario would play out what really is the risk from financial markets is the lame duck yeah. and for those that aren't aware that aren't uh, american citizens lame duck is the two and a half month period between when an old president is defeated or it finishes the second term and then the new president gets in which is usually around january 31st so call it february uh, during that period very little gets done legislatively legislatively if not nothing um, and if if the if if Biden wins and I and the scenario would be that they would a lot more than likely delay any major stimulus bill of two point six or three trillion or whatever they may do, 
that would be pushed off more than likely. In many ways, it would be kind of like a Bush Obama transition. You know, as as Bush was leaving, the markets were collapsing. Then right. once Obama, the markets didn't financially didn't really bottom until after Obama had been inaugurated, and then major stimulus passed, and then from there the markets kind of rocketed right. higher. Yeah, which Biden uh, muscled through with Paulson. Correct. Uh, well, I, something to keep an eye on during a lame duck mm-hmm. is the Peking duck. What's the Peking and I'll duck? let you. Where's Peking? Oh, <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah. So the the reason I think the lame duck is <laughs> I really think the lame duck session is 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 important is that well why is that delay of two and a half months important? Well, during that yeah. two and a half month period, if we don't get stimulus, DXY is going to face a lot of upper pressure. Yeah, um, and commodities will get hit across the board. I think gold so. Will Taiwan. And uh, with that being said, bro, I'm telling you, you are really good. You're a really excellent presentation. And, um, you know, uh, we could probably do this for a few hours. Do you think this completes your uh, narrative or we can keep Uh, going on with this? I think we're entering the final phase. I do think we need one more retest of that upper line on the euro to reject and one more high to bottom. Um, I think uh, if we do, then that's kind of that'll be the real kind of deciding factor. So I still think we need one more, but if we get that final one, that's a sign for you to start and kind of start scaling in. Um, and obviously uh, this is, you know, my uh, charts coach is my platform for those of you that were interested and want to learn more about kind of my theses and stuff. Uh, I've launched a lot of new uh, financial calculators and a bunch of stuff on the platform. I cover pretty much everything there is to cover. Um, and then recently I just launched my new audio podcast on the platform exclusively uh, the first episode is now live. It's a 60 minute long episode talking about the electric car revolution. Um, it compares lithium ion ba- battery tech to all the new potential disruptive technologies to kind of go through and see what are the biggest threats to Tesla motors. And I actually talk about one that could potentially be the biggest threat of all. And it's the last one you'd expect. And they're doing an IPO hopefully here in the soon in the future. So I kind of, if for those of you that kind of want more kind of other topics, I, I do a lot of audio podcasts.